In the next couple of videos, we're gonna be looking at transient response design. And so we're gonna do this in a relatively crude manner just by adjusting the gain. And so what that means is we have some root locus and we're adjusting the gain and moving our closed loop poles to a different point on the root locus. And if we move it to a certain point, we're gonna have our desired characteristics, whether it be settling time, peak time, percent overshoot, or some, some combination. However, uh, we are limited to points that are on the root locus. So we might not be able to meet two standards or two specifications. We might have to just focus on one. And so in the next unit, we're gonna come back with some more sophisticated techniques and say, how can we actually move our root locus so we can have, so we can meet more than one specification, essentially. So before we get into an example in the next video about how we can do this type of transient response design using this root locus, uh, just our gain adjustment, let's first sort of review some things we had talked about when we looked at our time response unit. So this was from chapter four in the textbook, so you can look at page 151 in the eighth edition, or you can also look on page 3-17 in the notes that are posted on Canvas. So we had noted a few important things about relationships in our S-plane. So if we look at our S-plane here, we have a real and a complex axis. And we had said if we have constant peak time, that's going to correspond to a horizontal line in our S-plane. So we'd have something like this, which would correspond to some particular peak time TP1. And so what we see is that that's essentially the imaginary part. So if we had some complex pole that was at this point, then that would be the imaginary part, which is giving us our peak time. So we also had a similar thing for our settling time. So we said vertical lines in our S-plane are corresponding to a constant settling time. So this would be TS1. And what we can see here is, you know, if we had some pole at some position here maybe, then this settling time is dependent on the real part of that pole. So finally, we said we have, if we have a radial line, that's going to correspond to a constant damping ratio zeta, or in other words, a constant percent overshoot because there's a one-to-one -one relationship between our zeta and our percent overshoot. And so we could draw, you know, just a random, I'm not trying to necessarily intersect those, those lines there, but a random radial line is gonna to correspond to some percent overshoot or some zeta, so we can call that uh, percent overshoot one, or we could call that zeta one. And again, those are gonna to correspond to each other. If we know one, we can find the other. So we're gonna use this idea in the next example. Uh, we also had several equations for second order systems. So that's an important thing to note. So we had second order system equations and so our second order system equations were for this peak time, settling time, percent overshoot. So we said our peak time for a second order system was approximately pi divided by omega sub n square root of one minus zeta squared. And again, we're just reviewing here. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know where this came from or how we got that, uh, but just sort of as a refresher. So our settling time was four over zeta omega n. And then finally our percent overshoot was equal to, so it was a little more complicated, we had exponential of negative zeta pi divided by square root of one minus zeta squared times 100. And we had said that our zeta is just equal to cosine of theta. So now let's look at our S-plane and consider sort of a specific pole. And we're gonna kind of come back to what I was talking about earlier about how the real part is gonna give us settling time and the imaginary part is going to give us peak time. And of course the relationship between the two is going to give us our percent overshoot or our damping ratio. So let's say we have some pole of interest here. Now of course it's gonna have some complex conjugate, but let's just focus on this real part up here. So we could draw a few things in here. So let's sort of draw some dashed lines. So it's going to have some real part. It's going to have some imaginary part and there's some radial distance. Let me draw that a little better horizontally there. Okay, and then we're gonna have some radial distance from the origin, and the angle on that is going to be theta. So now that we have all of those lines in there, let's come back and label some items. So we had said previously, this distance from the origin to the point is going to be our omega n, and the angle of that radial line is theta. So again, as we expect, that theta is corresponding to our zeta and ultimately our percent overshoot. This 
real part here is negative uh, zeta omega n, or we also said we could just call that negative sigma sub d. Our imaginary part up here is going to be j omega n times the square root of one minus zeta squared. And we also sort of simplified that. We said we can refer to that as just j omega d. Okay, so what we notice then is we can talk about sort of the imaginary and real parts in terms of our zeta and omega n. So our omega n times square root of one minus zeta squared is our imaginary part. And this is for any general pole. And our negative zeta omega n is our real part. And so we could talk about the magnitude of our real part as well. So we could say the magnitude of our real part is just negative, so the magnitude of negative zeta omega n is just equal to zeta omega n. And typically that's what we're going to be interested in. So taking these definitions and sort of relating it back to these equations, we can see that our TP is just going to be pi divided by the magnitude of our imaginary part. Because that omega n square root of one minus zeta squared is what we have right here. So of course, if we were considering this pole, that'd be negative. Uh, that's why I have the magnitude in that equation here. Similarly, we can see that our TS, four over zeta omega n, is just four over the magnitude of our real part. So four over the magnitude of our real part, as we saw right here. And so again, all this is just sort of meant to be a refresher of how do these TS, TP, and this percent overshoot all relate to position and the S plane. Uh, and you know, how do we, how do we define these constant lines for various values? So sort of bringing this back to our root locus now. So as we saw in some of the examples, typically we're dealing with systems of order higher than two. So we had certain conditions that had to be met in order to approximate that as a second order system. So we said when dealing with higher order systems, we can approximate as a second order system if we have certain condition about our pole locations. So can approximate, well, let's say can approximate as second order or using our second order equations when our higher poles are much further to the left. So higher order poles much further left in our S plane. And what are they much further left than? Much further left than our dominant poles. And so we have two dominant poles. And remember the rule that we talked about was five times further to the left, and that's kind of an arbitrary thing. Um, of course, it depends on how much accuracy you need in a given application. So let's sort of take a look at what this means in terms of our root locus. So we're gonna take a look at sort of a couple side-by-side -side plots here. Um, and both of these are going to represent our root locus. So let me plot, actually let's go ahead and add some items here. So let's say for this particular root locus, I'm gonna do my open loop poles in green. So let's say we have an open loop pole here, an open loop pole here, and a third open loop pole here. So if this is the basic structure of our root locus, so let's go ahead and copy that, and we're gonna look at it for a low gain, uh, a low gain condition and a high gain condition. Okay, so over here on the left, we can sort of plot our root locus. So we know that our root locus is going to look something like this. So we know it's gonna be on the real axis when it's to the left of an odd number of closed loop zeros or poles. and so we get something that looks like that. And we also know that we have three finite zeros. So we have three asymptotes. Um, and we can figure out all the angles and breakaway points and stuff like that. Um, but just to get a rough idea of what the sketch looks like, we're gonna have some breakaway point in between here. And this is going to be approaching some asymptotes in this manner like that. And so let me, should have copied this afterwards, but let me go ahead and just roughly draw that over here too. Keeping in mind, this should be the same Thing on both plots. Any difference is just my inability to draw it perfectly the same. Okay, so 
as I said, we're gonna consider sort of two cases, right? So the first case is going to be low gain. So remember, we're starting out at a gain of zero and we're gonna be at our close, or sorry, our open loop poles, which I've represented in green. So let me actually go ahead and mark that. So let's say green is going to be our open loop poles. And so remember, as we adjust the gain, we're moving along this blue path. So we're moving along like this and we're moving along like this. So if we have a low gain, then maybe we can say that for some low gain, our poles are going to be, our closed loop poles are going to be here and here, and our third one is going to be here. Now I've not drawn numbers, but let's say for instance, uh, this was at, let's say this was at negative two, and let's say this was at negative four. And so what we can see is that that's not, not really far enough left to be five times further left. Now, what happens if we allow that gain to increase? So if we have a higher gain, so now our poles are going to be moving along those root locus paths. So maybe we have something that looks like this. So maybe this pole is way over here. This pole is way over here. Of course, that's not desirable because now we're unstable. So let's say, let's be a little more realistic and say we want our system to still be stable, of course. And so maybe now this pole is well over here. And so at this point, uh, again, I'm not giving you certain values, but we can see that these poles over here are going to be, you know, they look like they're probably less than one if I had said this value was two. And this third pole over here for our higher order pole is gonna be more than five times further left than those dominant poles. And so in that case, using our second order system would be appropriate for this higher gain case, but not for this lower gain case. And so that's something we want to keep in mind as we're considering the example in the next video. One other thing too is that when we had these second order equations up here, we were assuming that we had no zeros. So in practice, if we have closed loop zeros, we want one of our higher order poles to be canceling out with that. So closed loop zeros should be approximately canceled out by our higher order poles. Or we want it to be far away from our, our dominant pole pair. So let's say from our dominant pole. And so ultimately, as we're trying to keep all of these things in mind, we're trying to, to keep in mind our closed loop zeros, you know, we're trying to do this approximation for higher order systems. Whenever you're in doubt, the best thing to do is to go back and to simulate our root locus. And so at the very least, that can give you a rough idea of what, you know, where you should be. And as we saw when we went over how to do that in MATLAB, we can actually go so far as to then look at step responses at a certain gain. So, definitely make use of that tool as you're working these types of problems.